You ever get that sinking feeling? You know, the one that you feel you've only heard maybe half the story or even a different story altogether. Hello and welcome to the Red Pill Diary. I'm Lewis and I'll be your host. So ready or not, let's flip the switch, and shed some light on it. It's cold on Lake Erie, especially in December. And on December 15th, 1796, it was cold and blustery. You know, 165 nautical miles southeast of Detroit sits Fort Presqu'ille. And why is that important? Because a gravely ill Mad Anthony Wade, a major general in the, and the United States Legion and his commanders-in-chief, was at the garrison at Fort Presqu'ille on the tip of what's now Erie, Pennsylvania, on his way home and on his way to Philadelphia, the ca- current then capital of the United States. Initially, he was stricken by gout, which he had off and on during the war, but now it had gotten worse. So he actually stopped and waited for, awaited his doctor from Pittsburgh to arrive about 100 miles. He would never make it. Ironically, he would not leave Fort Presqu'ille and arrive in Philadelphia, where he wanted to speak with Secretary of War James McHenry and discuss the interesting and colorful general, you guessed it, James Wilkinson. What's really interesting is due to the untimely death of General Wayne, James Wilkerson would obtain the spot of the, which he coveted, as the commander-in-chief of the newly formed Legion. Coincidence? It'd take another 60 years before the truth and the corroboration needed to shed the light on the dealings of General Wilkinson. But before I get there, we need to get the backstory. Set the stage for this backstory. We need to set some background, but we have to take our way back machine back 13 years from 1796 to 1783. Why 1783? Because 1783 was the end of the Revolutionary War and the signing of the Treaty of Paris. Paris. You know, there's a lot of treaties signed in Paris over the next century. I guess Paris is a place to sign treaties. I don't know, but this Treaty 1783 was one of many signed in Paris. The important part of this treaty was that Britain ceded what became known as the Northwest Territory. That included Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and I believe a little slice of Wisconsin at the time. The problem with this is the Native Americans lived there before the British showed up, before the French showed up, and the British and the French over the years have been trading with these people and providing with supplies. Actually, they're kind of helping them be dependent upon them so they could get these furs, which were lucrative, because they would then take them to Europe and make a huge profit off of them and give trinkets to the Native Americans. Or they would give them alcohol and get them reliant on the alcohol or the ammo or the seed or the flour or the other things that they were selling to them or giving to them in exchange for this, this fur. But after the treaty, the British didn't leave. The British got these forts from the French after the end of the French Indian War in 1763. They didn't get them by conquering the the native tribes. They were just there trading with these. They were trading forts, and the Native Americans would go there and trade. These Native Americans weren't party to this Treaty of Paris in 1783, and Britain really had no legal right to give away their property. Now, that would be the perspective of the Native Americans. Now, British, of course, would say, well, the king gave us all this property. It's not up to you, I would suspect. And it was true in this case. The Native Americans weren't very happy about it. So following this treaty of 1783, from 1784 to 1789, there was a mass migration of people going west over the Appalachian Mountains into this area to settle it. That, of course, increased considerably the violence between the encroaching, from the Native Americans' perspective, American settlers, and primarily the Shawnee and Miami peoples in Kentucky and Ohio, along the river where these settlements started to pop up. The problem was this fledgling government was unable to really protect the people west of the Appalachian Mountains because they did not have the army or the militias large enough to protect them from these uh, raiding parties of Native Americans against the settlers who they saw were encroaching on their land. So in that setting, enters Major General Anthony St. Clair and the unsupporting actor, at this time, Lieutenant Colonel James Wilkerson. Now, General St. Clair was a seasoned general. 
He was the formerly the president or the ninth president of the United States in Congress assembled. This was before the ratification of the Constitution and when George Washington became the, the, the president under the Constitution. He was also the governor of the Northwest Territories. He had worked with Native Americans. The issue was while he was negotiating or talking to these Native American tribes, he was basically giving them Hobson's choice, essentially take it or leave it. There was no real negotiation going on, and the Native Americans resented it, obviously, because they saw this as their land and the Americans were encroaching upon it. And so they decided to leave it. George Washington and Secretary of War Knox sends General Hamar out forces with federal troops and a contingent of militia from Pennsylvania and Kentucky to bring the tribal coalition to heel. But he's defeated. He's defeated by Little Turtle. Little Turtle was the war chief of the Miami people. Hamar was court-martialed and St. Clair was appointed commander-in-chief of the American army and George Washington orders him to mount a more vigorous effort in 1791. Colonel Wilkinson was participating and he was asked to lead an expedition and to be a really a distraction for the movement of St. Clair's army into that area. And he had a skirmish with uh, some Indians who were sick or left behind because most of the warriors had gone off to a meeting with the, the government, the United States government, trying to figure out how they could work together in this area. While at the same time, St. Clair is moving into their territory. And Wil Wilkinson was supposed to create a diversion, a distraction. Instead, he burned their crops and he captured Little Turtle's daughter. That had the opposite effect. Just imagine somebody captured your daughter. Would that make you more inclined to settle or would that just infuriate you even more? Well, you know what happened. So Arthur Sinclair, Major General, had the same issues that Hamar had. He had logistical problems. He had the micromanagement and timing issues from Knox trying to get him to move faster. Washington was pushing him to get this, this thing resolved. And his quartermaster and contractors, they didn't provide the supplies. The supplies were lacking or defective. Again, money was provided through the Congress for the Secretary of War to use to provide the, the needed troops and necessities for St. Clair. But here again, we see the same issue with the funds being diverted. Funds were not used for supply or pay the troops. This money was siphoned off or portions of it was allocated by a contractor named Dewar, a friend of the War Secretary of War, Knox, to use that money to buy land in this territory, Northwest Territory, in order to speculate and sell it at a profit that no one would know the difference. Does that sound familiar? This contractor actually produced defective goods, not just in this battle, but we'll see this going on in, in future battles, defective goods and defective outfits and defective equipment and defective armaments to the army and the militia and wouldn't pay, the, didn't pay the militia or the army and they ended up with less qualified candidates to fight these battles. So the siphoning off of these funds hampered the efforts of the initial army set out to do what George Washington and the Continental Congress had ordered them to do. Don't we see that now where budgets are produced and funds are available, but those funds never get used for what they're supposed to. Instead, they're diverted to other uses. And in this case here, to be used for investment in buying property in the Northwest Territory. They weren't used to buy supplies or pay the troops. Instead, they sent them defective materials. They'd send them axe heads that actually bend when you, you chopped a tree. They send them anvils without the proper equipment associated with it, which would just actually break. The shoes would wear off their feet in a couple of days. The food was rotten when they got it. So these types of things occurred along the way. And guess what else? They had the British out there causing trouble. And what were they doing? They were giving them more ammo and more guns, and they were helping to spy and plan. And uh, they knew that Sinclair was on, on the way there. And they were giving them information, and they were helping them along. The Native American coalition was animated and angry. 
St. Uh, Clair's army was ill-prepared. They were an untrained militia. They had the defensives that weren't defensive uh, perimeter wasn't set up. They had defective supplies, they had defective equipment. They had guns that wouldn't fire. And when the uh, Native Americans came running out of the bushes with their tomahawks slashing, they bolted. They didn't stand. They bolted. Some did, but some others didn't. And they were surrounded. So it was a very bloody defeat. And people ran. And it was ugly. So uh, what happened? Well, essentially, St. Clair got fired. And that's the only way to put it. The investigation that was ongoing with the uh, House of Representatives set up this dynamic between uh, the separation of powers and executive privilege. This is where it started. What you see today with the fight between these branches, this is where this all started in 1791. And this battle or this massacre was the first instance of the Congress doing an investigation about this massacre and essentially Knox's inability or the negligence in providing the supplies for St. Clair and other armies through these contractors. Now, I'm sure you've heard of Federalists and Anti-Federalists. Now, Anti-Federalists doesn't mean against the Federalists. It just means they had a different perspective than the Federalists. Generally, the Federalists wanted a stronger, bigger government in order to be like the Europeans. The Anti-Federalists really wanted more states to have control over that with a very small government. Sound familiar? Well, we're still seeing the same types of arguments. Well, this battle provided the opportunity for the Federalists to get what they wanted because society now understood what was going on. They, were, they heard about the massacre. They wanted protection from the government, and now they're willing to do what? Give them the bigger government and a standing army. Why is a standing army a problem? Think back to the Romans. When you cross the Rubicon, why was that, this, that statement? Because when you cross the Rubicon, you're going to where? Rome. What's in Rome? Not the army. The army is on the other side of the Rubicon. If you come across the Rubicon with an army, guess who's going to be in charge? The army. That's the reason why they wanted the army to stay ab above the Rubicon. That's also the reason, the, one, of the, one of the reasons the Federalists, the Anti-Federalists didn't want a standing army because it tends to align itself with the, the powers that be, the government, which only increases the ability to the government to do what? pushed down against the, the, the common people. That's exactly what they got tried to get away from with Britain. And now the Federalists get what they want. Enter Major General Matt Anthony Wayne. He was assigned to build the Legion. That's what it was called, the Legion. And he was provided the resources to do that. Well, guess who else wanted to be in charge of the Legion? Brigadier General James Wilkinson. Wilkinson thought he was going to get it, and it was angry and embarrassed that he didn't. He wanted to be selected for the top command. He believed he was the best, and he believed he should be chosen. But instead, Washington chose Mad Anthony Wayne and gave Wilkinson second in command. Now, here's where the fun begins. From the get-go, Wilkinson starts to write his friends in Congress and even Knox, telling him how great he is, and Wayne's now assigned I mean, Wayne assigned Wilkinson to Fort Washington outside present-day Cincinnati. So he's in this, this Northwest Territory. At the same time, Wayne is training and developing this legion before bringing his new army out westward because he was tasked to do what St. Clair didn't do. And Congress was now behind it because of the massacre. And they needed to protect that area. And like I said, they had um, a financial incentive to get people over there and get them protected. And they needed to make those – they wanted to make those – that area into states. So Wilkinson start beginning to write to his friends in Congress and even to the, war, the Secretary of War of Knox, tell him how great he was and how – and then basically started to undermine his, his boss, Anthony Wayne. So he started encouraging dissension among the officers and get people to sympathize with him. Wilkinson's behavior now shows pretty much consistently what he has been doing from the get-go. And so now he's trying to discredit Wayne. And he actually wrote an article. He sent it to a Cincinnati newspaper. He said, basically, Wayne was a drunkard. He was incompetent and wasteful and known for playing favorites. That's interesting comments considering Wayne basically was very complimentary 
of Wilkerson and the other officers in, a, in the, during the Battle of Fallen Timbers in August of 1794. Actually, Wayne praised Wilkerson and the other colonels in this report to Knox. Wilkerson, on the other hand, he found fault with all of this and he basically insisted that nobody had really contributed much to this battle except for him. And essentially, the reason the battle was won and really wasn't a battle at all, in, in, in his description, it was basically because the Native Americans were feeble and foolish in their leadership. And so Wilkinson actually wrote his friend, Henry Enns, as a lawyer and a friend, in December of 19, 1794. He just described Wayne as a, a liar, a drunkard, a fool an associate of the lowest order of society and a companion of their vices of desperate fortune, my rancorous enemy, a coward, a hypocrite, and the contempt of every man of sense and virtue, close quote. Now that is a lot of anger. That was the character of James Wilkinson. The important part about this is Wilkinson's campaign to the media, through the newspaper, and through some of his congressional friends, really gave ammunition to the Anti-Federalists because they didn't want a strong, large army. And this gave them the ammunition they needed to reduce it. So if they reduced the size, it would be smaller in regulation, but also it would allow Major General Anthony Wayne not to command it because it was a smaller army. And guess who would get to command it then? A Brigadier General. And who happened to be the Brigadier General at the time? Because, of course, they weren't going to demote Major General Anthony Wayne. Who would be getting it? Wayne wouldn't get it. Wayne would be forced into retirement. And what would Wilkinson get? He'd assume the command. Secretary Knox tried to encourage Wilkinson to drop it, but he wouldn't. So Knox sent it to Anthony Wayne, and that was the first time he had knowledge that Wilkinson was conspiring against him. Wilkinson's behavior was just like it was with Horatio Gates in the Conway Cabal. So during this period of time, Anthony Wayne tells Captain Zebulon Pike, remember that name, because he's going to come up again, to look, be on the lookout for uh, a Thomas Power. He was Pike was told to search for documents concerning Wilkinson, but at the close, he, he, he came close, but Wilkinson continued to slip through the, the net. He didn't get the information that Wayne was looking for. But Thomas Power was a contact for Wilkinson, so Wilkinson knew that Wayne was looking for things to give to McHenry about him and his conduct. That set him in, that set this in things, these things in motion. When Wayne knew that Wilkinson wanted his job and would do anything to do to destroy it, to get it. And now Wilkinson was alerted to Wayne's conduct. And he knew that Zebulon Pike was paying attention and nearly uh, found the information that would have destroyed Wilkinson. Mad Anthony Wayne would not make it to Philadelphia. He wouldn't make it off the island of Fort Presqu'ile. He wouldn't see his family, and he wouldn't be able to share the information or get information from the Secretary of War McHenry. He died, according to the reports at the time, of gout. How convenient for General Wilkinson. You know, natural causes can explain his death. He had a history of fevers. He had reoccurring bouts with malaria. His stomach was upset, probably because he's eating Peruvian bark. I thought they used it at the time for quinine. You know, that's basically you could get a peptic ulcer. You know, he had subdominal, abdominal pains and fever. You know, that could he could have had a ruptured ulcer. He could have had peritonitis. And he could have died of sepsis or organ failure. But if you accept Wayne's death as natural causes, which that is what the historians believe, you got to accept that the timing of this death is just a simple matter of chance that was so welcome to Wilkinson's, for him, for his consideration, because he was given the command. So here he is, after Wayne's death, Wilkinson's given his command, despite Washington and McHenry's doubts, the lack of any viable candidates. And Wilkinson had some friends in Congress. And so he ends up stepping right into the one thing that he wanted, the command of the army. So we've seen this before. You know, this is very coincidental that this man would die in this fort on his way to talk to McHenry about the things that he knew or was learning about Wilkinson. And Wilkinson knew that he was going there. And Wilkinson wanted his position. He could have died of natural causes. 
but there could be other explanations. That doesn't make it a conspiracy theory. It just means there are other factual bases for what could have occurred. Wilkinson knew that Wayne was hot on his trail, and he might be able to prove Wilkinson's conduct, which would be detrimental and fatal for Wilkinson. George Washington at the time was somewhat suspicious, and Wilkinson may have feared that Wayne knew more than he actually did know. And that exposure of Wilkinson would result in his death, either by hanging or a firing squad. Wilkinson's life was in severe jeopardy, and he knew it. And you must remember, we must remember that Wilkinson also knew that Wayne had incriminating information and was seeking to get more. Wayne's growing knowledge of Wilkinson's activities made Wayne a target. And as Wade stood on the verge of discovering this information that would put a rope around Wilkinson's neck or a firing squad, the death of Wilkes Wayne would solve Wilkinson's problems. And an added benefit, the death of Wayne left Wilkinson as the commander of the Legion of the United States. Machiavelli would be proud. I'm going to leave the lights on for you. Well, we filled those pages. If you have comments, suggestions, share them. You know, the more input, the more likely a better outcome. I'm moving forward because backwards is not an option. I've turned the lights on here and I'll be leaving them that way. Join me next time on The Red Pill Diary.